Hello there, YouTube. My name is Dr. Carlo Oyer. I'm a board certified emergency physician, and I am husband to a wife that suffered from HSV encephalitis. So in this video, I want to share with you some of the imaging that we had done on her brain to kind of show you what she had as findings in the brain so you can compare to your own experience or what to expect, and we'll talk about the implications of that and so on. The first thing I'm going to show you is the CT scan of the day she was diagnosed with the encephalitis. Now, she's already a week, week and a half into the process. It started just as a cold with bad headaches, some neck stiffness, and then show up with the CAT scan that you see above. I'm going to go ahead and pause that video so that I can kind of move it up and down and we can see what we're talking about. So in this scan right here, um, whoa, we're going to see... And I wonder if I can, no, I don't think I can. Oh yeah, those are the eyeballs, that's the nose there. And then for, uh, you can see kind of the ears here on the side. So this is the base of the skull about yay distance, like eyes and ears, okay? And we're gonna move on those pictures. Uh, this is more towards the neck area. So we're gonna move back up into the brain. And already here, you start to see some difference. Uh, whenever you look at a picture in an X-ray, you compare the left to right and make sure they're okay. So look at the uh, right side of her brain here and the left side. You can see that it's much darker, much emptier than on the right side. Again, this is now the temporal lobe. We moved up to about here. And you can see that the right side looks kind of gray, like gray matter in the brain. And this here looks more like gray with, with a lot more black. Black is actually fluid or empty space. So some of that brain is liquefied. It, it's gone, probably blood and bruising and so on. Let's keep going. We're going to keep going up. This is the level where you can see the ventricles. The ventricles are areas of the brain that collect fluid from the brain and then take it down to the spine. The line you're seeing in the middle, it's an artificial line thrown by the rate radiologist who's reading the scan to show that there's some shift. Shift means that the brain is moving or shifting from one side to the other. And that is dangerous. Whenever there's shift, there's means a lot of pressure, swelling, pushing, compressing these um, backs of fluid. They're cisterns, basically. And by compressing, you can see the right one is a little thicker than the left one because it's being compressed and tightened. And the midline is being pushed away. That puts a risk because once it's pushed enough, the whole brain could potentially herniate. It would be pushed into the central canal, which is a very, very dangerous scenario. And then we go apart to the top of the brain, which is actually fine. Now, when she was initially diagnosed, the radiologist came to me uh, specifically at the bedside with this picture and said she's had a stroke because strokes look like that, a darkened, blackened area of the brain because there's missing brain tissue and it's replaced by fluid. And I was in denial. I said, no, no, that's not right. Can't be. And I said, I don't want to be that husband or the doctor that's in denial about his own family members. It's just it doesn't make sense. She had a fever. She had a headache. She had a neck stiffness. You told me she had an abscess. She has some kind of cavernous center thrombosis, some kind of infection in her brain, even a mass. I'd be more eager to accept, but not a stroke. So he went back, sent the pictures to a neuroradiologist, who, a, a radiologist who specializes on brain tissues and reading, and went ahead and came back with the diagnosis of probable HSV encephalitis. The reason for it being because this encephalitis has a pre predilection. It prefers to attack the temporal lobe area, as you can see here, as her front, frontal lobe over here, occipital lobe back here, and this is the temporal lobe on her left. And that's how she was admitted to the hospital. Then she was flown over to a bigger center. She just started on IV antiviral medications and so on. This is the MRI. And we're going to be moving into her brain from her ear into the brain. And this was much later. This was not right away. But again, we're going to pause this video so that we can kind of look at it slowly. Uh, let me pause that. And already you can see right there, this is normal brain tissue, okay? It looks like every other picture of this is kind of like mixed in. And you can see this looks like empty sacks of water. Basically because she's lost her temporal lobe. It, it, it's gone over time. That air was insulted by injury and damage and swelling so bad that the tissue didn't recover. It just 
died. He was replaced by water and scar tissue and so on. You can see it right there. Normal brain tissue and not normal brain tissue there. All right, that's her MRI after recovery. This was not right away. Um, actually, this MRI was a few years later when my wife actually had a grand mal seizure event. And then we did the CAT MRI. Now we are able to compare the CAT scan that was done initially to the CAT scan now. And you can see how much different that brain looks. Remember before it was just a little gray? Now look at it. This is normal brain tissue here. This is bad, bad brain tissue there. Um, look how big that area before it was much smaller and that was this big area of blackness and, and just not doing well. And you can see it extends all the way to the edge of the cranium or the, uh, of the brain and the rest of her brain is okay. So what has done to her is she has trouble sometimes hearing out of her ear. She don't sometimes has ringing out of the ear. She has minor balance issues because of temporal lobe, because of the ear and the centers on the ear have to do with balance. She has affected that. And because that area of the brain has been replaced with water and scar tissue, she now has developed grand mal seizure. She had one episode of a few of them back to back. It's actually called um, status epilepticus just because it happened so frequent and sustained. She didn't have any for about a year. And then when we were weaning her out of one medication, starting the other one, she had a, a seizure while she was in bed. But then she hasn't had any since. Her memory and many memories of the past have been wiped out of her brain. She'll see pictures and she just doesn't know when were those taken, who took them or whatever. And then um, you know, she, she uses calendars to help remind stuff. She gets tired very easily. She usually has to take a nap in the middle of the day. And of course that's a good thing that she does because sleep deprivation can trigger seizures. So we want to encourage sleep and rest as much as possible. Anyway, that's it for this video. We just wanted to show you the images and the CAT scan and MRI so you can see what it looked like acutely, what it looked like post recovery and what the eventual damage that happens to the brain. Of course, your particular case is gonna be different. What area of the brain affected, how big an area of the brain is it, how uh, plasticity, how, what's the plasticity of your brain in order to recover. And honestly, with that much brain missing, I'm surprised she's performs so well, like she can do normal house chores and drive and take care of the kids. But she can't do homework, she can't fill forms out. She has a lot of trouble with a lot of memory issues and her personality has changed a lot, but she has recovered and she is functional. I'm very grateful for that. Anyway, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something about encephalitis, what it looks in a CT scan and in an MRI, what it looks like acutely and then chronically once that's healed. And if you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Thank you.